Now, this is different to going into a pawn shop. That's so you want to, you know, cash in your old guitar and get some money, you go to a pawn shop. This is a different sort of pawn. It's also spelled differently. But some of the brand names, let me read you these. Nobody in the room would know any of these names, I know. <laughs> but do some of you know people outside of this room who know these names? <laughs> you porn, porn hub, my dirty hobby, Brazzers, and others. 16 billion hits per month combined. That is a business that requires enormous scale in terms of compute capability, and it means a business is also highly vulnerable to all the things we heard about in the presentation yesterday about cybercrime and hacking and those vulnerabilities. So, we're going to come over here, and could I have a glass of water for Fabian, please? Thank you. Just thinking of you, Fabian, it's quite hot up here, I know. So, I'm going to, first of all, can you speak to the room, say hello to everybody here in Rust? Yeah. Speak up. Uh, speak up. Speak up, oh, that's better. Enough? Don't shout, don't shout. No, no, okay, okay, don't worry. No, that's good. All good. So, welcome, Hi. Fabian, thank you for joining us. I hope you're feeling better. I understand you're in Iceland and you got a cold. I, I was in Iceland, I am back home. But uh, I, I, feel do, I, I do feel better you now. Look? Yesterday I felt horrible, uh, so I decided to sleep. It would better than get up uh -huh. at 5 a.m. to get to you guys. So I'm sorry that I'm not there. Oh, okay, good. Well, I'm just going to log into this PC that's not mine. So I can... Uh, uh. Does anyone want to know Soren's password for his systems? Because <laughs> he's just told me, and I'm about to put it on f Facebook for everybody. It seems to be quite easy, considering the fact that you don't have a note or something. And the first, he gave me the wrong password. All right, so <laughs> we're going to do this with questions spontaneously. Tell us a bit about how you got into the business initially. Uh, right back in the beginning, what was your thinking, the opportunity that you saw, and what were those first steps to, to move in that direction? Uh, so I, I started in... 97 in the business in itself, uh, not necessarily as, as an owner of, of anything, but as a developer, that's how I got in. Uh, and um, I relatively soon uh, started working with lots of different people and I got to know the industry quite well. The when you say the industry, we're we talking the hosting industry or the other industry? Uh, the, 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 in general, the porn industry. Okay, uh, just to be clear. In general, that. Yes. Yes. Uh, and sorry. So what was that like? <laughs> Uh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I think that's the best. Uh, okay, we can spend some time on interesting. Yes, exactly. Uh, no, but we, uh, I, I relatively quickly uh, saw um, inefficiencies in, in lots of different things, mainly in the tech uh, and, and in the way that uh, they build certain things. Um, and I decided to see if I can uh, buy some uh, well working assets uh, and see if I can optimize them and, and make more money with them. Um, and the first ones I bought that worked quite well. This was not necessarily related to any differences in, in the way it was hosted or anything like that, but more uh, in, a, in a feature uh, and, and programming uh, uh, way, uh, but obviously always somehow related to bandwidth and, and things like that, since, um, of so course, this is the main, main driver of the business, is content. Features, now my mind's boggling. We're talking about the uh, end user experience? Uh, yes. So in this case, it was live, uh, li live cam business, for example. Okay. Uh, which was uh, just bandwidth in intensive. Starting and bandwidth intensive and making that work well and things like that. Uh, that was the initial kickstart of, of my starting really as an owner in this business. Thank you, sir. So, do you think that porn has always been a driver of technical innovation for the reasons that you saw those opportunities to provide a better service, a better quality, a better experience? Do you think that's still true today, that porn is driving a lot of the innovation and uh, evolution in our industry? 
Um, today, I think it's less and less. I, I think uh, porn has gotten to a point where it needs very little extra innovation other than faster delivery, where it, it might push in terms of getting the cheapest deals, uh, but that's not really innovation. Uh, I think the last, uh, the last position where it really changed anything in technology or where it pushed a certain uh, aspect or a certain um, uh, development uh, on so that it, it would succeed was Blu-ray versus HD, HD DVD because HD DVD wouldn't work with the business, with the porn business, uh, which basically killed it. Um, wow, and now that's, that is the first that's significant, isn't it? One technology, well, yes. we're talking about accelerating certain technologies, but what we see is the opposite. This has actually brought to a tragic end. Yeah, yes. A technology I mean, the, the that didn't allow that possibility. Yes, so the most famous one uh, was, uh, and, at least in my opinion, was back in the day when uh, Beta and VHS was, was, was competing. Yep. And there again also, VHS was the one that won because the industry, the porn industry, started to embrace it and and therefore it succeeded more. I, I cannot obviously prove that Blu-ray succeeded because porn used it. Uh, let's not go too far, but uh, I mean, it's definitely one of the factors, considering the fact that you saw So it. I see the marketing angle here, the choice of the name Blu-ray. <laughs> yes, these marketing people, they've got it all upstairs. Yes, yes. Blu-ray, I get the connection. <laughs> of course. Now, I'm thinking we've got one of our sponsor partners outside is called Internet X, so I suppose here we're talking about Internet X. <laughs> There's a product line extension there somewhere. Okay, so, yes, there is a connection with porn driving our industry, but it's not as strong now as it was because porn can't go much further because it's, uh, it's saturated. I don't know what the right word is. Well, uh, saturated, uh, I, I think the, uh, right now, in the last... I'd say four or five years, there's been very limited uh, innovation in terms of new ideas and new things in porn. Uh, and really, as I said, it, content is the driving factor, right? Um, so the amount of content that is there uh, and that is viewed is the thing that drives any of these companies up. Um, and uh, so bandwidth is really the main thing it needs. Um, it doesn't need higher computing powers or anything like that. So any of the today's technologies like AI and all this stuff is not really anything that, that porn uses heavily. Um, so it, it won't be a driving factor there. It can later in time, uh, like virtual reality, for example, where maybe it will do one thing or another. But uh, right now, I don't see that happening. Virtual reality. Okay, yeah, that takes it to a whole new level. Yes. Sort of a bit like your glass of water here. Yes, exactly. Just waiting to be embraced. Yes. Okay, question. When you were starting out, did you, uh, what did your first websites look like? Were they f for the first back-end systems? What did they look like? Uh, so um, we pretty much uh, uh, threw hardware at it, to be honest. So we never really used... No pun any... intended. Yes. Hardware. Sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, we, we, we didn't really use the cloud or anything like that. The first contact we had with uh, any cloud-like uh, system um, was a CDN, uh, which we started using relatively early on um, to optimize uh, mainly our bandwidth cost uh, because um, for any of the businesses that were very heavy on, on video, of course, the cost was a huge driver and it was all bandwidth. Uh, and we optimized um, mainly versus the cost uh, there. Uh, and in terms of running the actual backends, um, it was standard servers, nothing cloud-based because we wanted it in-house. So we always kept it locally with us uh, and it made upgrades easier for us in this case. But it was based on old architectures and so on. So uh, I think today, if we would have restarted it completely from scratch, it might be different. Um, but back then, it made no sense to have it in the cloud, other okay. than the content itself. So that's a great point to think about. If you were starting the business again today, given where yes. technology is, what would be your starting point? Would you go straight to public cloud? Would you put it on AWS or Azure and go from there? Uh, I, no, I, I think um, some parts definitely on something like them, uh, like uh, uh, probably storage um, 
put it on the cloud-based system, okay. uh, although it would need to be a very good deal because the amount of storage also is tremendous that we use, of course, or we used. Um, but, and, and use CDN, obviously, from the get-go uh, for delivery. Uh, but in terms of the actual systems uh, that run the sites, uh, the actual website itself, um, I don't know. It, it's, it's tricky uh, for me. Uh, it's, since it's not really a, a tremendously um, software-intensive task, any of this, uh, it probably doesn't make much sense to put it on the cloud, at least not for me. Mm -hmm. The part that might, be, might, might make, make a lot of sense to put on the cloud for scalability and, and if it's a good system that can scale uh, by itself, um, then it would be the ad network, uh, which this one was a much more technically advanced than the actual websites were, uh, like the ad network of Pornhub and, and UPorn and so on. It was much more of a technically advanced system uh, and is still today than, than the rest of this, the systems are. So there, probably cloud makes sense, but but for the rest, it probably doesn't. Okay. For me. So, building out your own uh, data centers, where were you hosting that? Uh, which geographies or what sort of um, global footprint did you need to be able to serve uh, acceptable experiences worldwide? So we had uh, we had one main uh, data center we used together with the with the with the provider. So we didn't have our own. Um, no. We, we used uh, a, a third-party hosting provider, basically, to handle our servers because we didn't want to have any uh, ops people in uh, on our side, only for office things, basically. So this was uh, so co-location, or this is managed services? Yes. Um, managed service co-location mix. Um, Hybrid. Like, yes. I, I, I wouldn't call it uh, co-location. I wouldn't call it managed service. So it's a bit of a, a mix of that, a very okay. specific stuff. OK. Um, and we, so we had that in the US, in New York, and in LA, uh, two okay, systems. either side of the US, I understand. Yes. Uh, and we had a complete failover solution in Amsterdam, just in case Makes the US Makes sense. Would Amsterdam sounds like a good place for this, yes. Yes. <laughs> just in case there's a world war happening and the US is dead or something, uh, who knows. Um, people still need porn, right? So therefore, we had a backup in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and we had uh, backup solutions just for the content itself, uh, in-house, in our uh, one of our offices, in this, in this case uh, in, in Montreal, um, a big storage array uh, for, for backup of all content. Um, and we had the same, uh, I think, in, in Europe somewhere. I'm not sure. Maybe also Amsterdam. Uh, so full redundant Amsterdam backup twice. All, all content. Yeah. I get the picture. Very important Amsterdam. <laughs> Okay, um, so, so in terms of the front-end operations, it was very U.S.-centric, New York yes. and L.A. Yes, D yes. So tell us but about the, the demographics of your uh, customer base. Was it also very U.S.-centric, or was it completely global? Or how would you describe your user footprint? So it is, it is very, very global. So uh, I, I can give you some numbers for uh, last year, if you want. So I have Let me check with the audience. Would you like numbers from last year? Accepted. Accepted. Okay. Okay. Ju just uh, since you mentioned 16 billion users, um, hits. So uh, hits. But, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, last year, Pornhub alone. So which one? Sites. Which Pornhub? Pornhub. Uh, so and this is roughly, I'd say, one fifth of all the traffic that MindGeek has today had uh, 23 billion visits, not hits, visits. 28 billion? Uh, 23 billion, just Pornhub. OK. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the, the top five or so countries, uh, it's the US uh, and, well, per capita in this case. Huh? So um, it, that's why this, the numbers are maybe a bit strange. It's US. Uh, it, then it's Iceland, it's United Kingdom, it's Canada, <laughs> and it's New Zealand. Now, where's he just been? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I rest my uh, case. <laughs> but if you look at actual traffic, uh, so really users, uh, not, not per capita, it's the United States, UK, Canada, India, Japan, France, Germany, Australia, Italy, Brazil, Mexico, Russia. Uh, uh, but it is worldwide. Australia's right? on the list. It's good. That's good. Yes, yes. It, it, is, it is completely worldwide. Uh, now, you told um, me when we were talking earlier that you can get really macro statistics on, on usage. 
Could you tell yes. me how many people in this room, <laughs> oh, sorry. for all? academic reasons of bandwidth usage, would have done a small test? Probably all of them. <laughs> Probably all of them. This is a funny question I always ask. Uh, sadly, I'm not here today, so I can't see the audience. So usually I would ask in the beginning, uh, who has not been to one of my sites? <laughs> and usually no hand goes up, so. <laughs> all right. So you build out this huge, dedicated server farms, New York, Los Angeles, double back up something in Amsterdam, but it was a, a mix between co-location and managed services. The cloud may make sense for some backup components, but the rest you need to have a direct handle on it. What happened next in the whole evolution of the business? So that's a very general question. <laughs> um, a general answer for the general public, I think, would be perfect. Yes. Uh, I, I think the, the biggest thing is that uh, the business is moving more and more uh, to live content. Sorry, more and more? Uh, to live content. So, so it, it, it live was content. already... Yes, it was already very important back in the day when I owned the company, uh, but it is more and more so simply because uh, in terms of money making, um, live content is, can't be copied and it can't be uh, stolen in the end because it's no longer live at that point, so it's not interesting anymore. Um, so therefore, uh, that is a huge uh, driver for the business. Um, and it's a very important one. And it completely changes uh, the kind of hosting you need and so on. Huh? Does because that also mean then, Fabian, you've got to go more upstream into the production end of it? It's not just distribution and serving. It's creating the content now if it's all live. Is that a fair assumption in terms of the business model evolution? Um, yes. I mean, to make money either way, to make real good money, you need to do that either way already back then. Um, at least have a good mix of it. So, I mean, this was the strength of Manwin, that it had the mix of both creation and, and, and true sites. Uh, but uh, it's getting more and more important today. So the big companies, uh, the, the real money makers in the business, uh, if you look at uh, single websites, they are without a question the live uh, things and not um, necessarily the ones that have the traffic. Uh, they still make obviously good money, but um, if you look at the amount of money that, that the live systems make, it's a lot better. Uh, so, so that's the more important part. So if we're thinking in terms of monetization then, it's easier to monetize live than yes. distributed content. Exactly. That's it. No, no question. And this, this requires quite a bit of different hosting environments, right? Because uh, it's a completely different context and it makes a lot of things more complicated. Uh, so in this case, very likely a cloud-based system is much more capable because simply scaling it is going to be a lot easier. Right? Because ah. depending on how many live people you have online, you can simply add things to the cloud and that's it. You just need endpoints to it, right? And that's it. So that, that's, that's, I think, a lot uh, more interesting today. Okay. Again, one of the factors than it was before. I'm just joining the dots in my brain as you're speaking, Fabian. Now I understand with this cloud discussion, I understand SaaS. Yes, Sex as a service. Exactly. <laughs> I always thought it was software. OK. So. That's a breakthrough for me. Thank you. OK, so monetization, much easier in the live content than uh, the distribution of existing content. Why did you settle the business? Uh, you know, there, there's one big, uh, pro not problem, but big thing you need to realize when you're in this business is that um, there is a lot of uh, hypocrisy in the world. And as you know, no one has ever been to these websites, as you yes. have told us. And we're an example in this room here, yes. Exactly, exactly. O only their friends were. Uh, and they would obviously be looked down upon if they would visit these websites. Um, and uh, this comes into lots of problems when you uh, deal with simple things in life like a bank account, uh, because it gets really complicated. Um, and so at, at some point, I decided that I wanted to stop uh, being in this business because it just made my life easier. Um, you're, you're saying you became too hope high profile. You didn't want to that level yes. many people checking yes. on what you were doing. You yes, wanted exactly. your life and, back. And, yes. And and in the end, it's not only that, it's also the fact that because of uh, being quite known, uh, a simple thing like having a bank account 
uh, cause problems because the banks would not want to work with them. Uh, because it's reputational risk, because they have never been to these sites either, right? I love this idea, reputational risk. Yes, very, very a big word in the financial business. Guns and are completely fine, of course. Okay, so this leads me to the next question. The business you have is extremely strong and growing. The downside is reputational risks. How did the new buyers handle that dilemma of reputational risk? Because it went to VCs, as I recall. Uh, yes. So if hmm. you look at um, uh, <laughs> if you look at the, the uh, there was a piece and at uh, that uh, there's a documentary that was reviewed at by South by, Thos by Th Southwest just recently. Uh, and it also was in German papers, uh, a summary of it, um, I, I heard. Uh, and it mentions one thing, and that is that um, MindGeek today is a lot smaller and a lot more hidden than uh, Manwin was. And I think that is the key thing. Uh, they just co went completely uh, under the radar, making themselves school and and not really sure anyone what it is and who it is and who owns it and so on and this is how they get by easier than I did I just didn't want to do that ever because I uh, didn't like the fact that I had uh, like uh, not problems but had uh, issues with banks and such because I found it hypocritical and I wanted to more fight against that than hide myself so I never hid myself so this is why I was always more public than than currently the new owners are, and I think that's why they have no problem. So it's a, a personal conviction reason for leaving, in fact. Yes, yes, I think that's the main thing. That's good. So let's talk about what's next for Fabian. Where are you going to go next? You've got a, a, a great starting point. There's so much opportunity there. What is your next project or projects? Uh, I am looking at all kinds of little things. Uh, I do investments mainly. Uh, I have uh, my own projects um, that are completely out there and random. Uh, nothing right now that is uh, proving to be anything huge, but who knows uh, what happens. Um, I'm, I'm really just uh, mainly trying to help startups uh, okay. because I, I, I have a very good feel for what works and what doesn't, and I think, and people value my input, so I, I like to help them. And uh, that's the main thing I do right now, and that's how I pass my day. Next to traveling, like to Iceland last week. Yes, I'm interested in that statistic of Iceland being the second biggest population of consummation in the world. Yes. I, okay, so you've become a startup coach. Do those startups yes. have to be wanting to go into the porn industry? No, 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 no. no. no I, 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 actually, it's, uh, I get requests for startups that want to do something in porn every day. Roughly, every day. Every two days, Yes, it happens a lot. And I always tell them no, because there, there is no new ideas, at least not right now. Uh, I have not seen any new ideas yet. Been, there, all, uh, been there, done that. Yes. So those opportunities that would be attractive and, and uh, inspiring and motivating for you to work with, what sort of areas of um, business direction are they heading in? The ones that you would agree to, to coach a startup in? Uh, something technical that has to do with... Uh, um, a mix of consumer and business, I guess. Uh, okay. um, nothing, but nothing extremely specific. Uh, I am not very, very focused. I look at so many things and it's just depending on, on if something clicks in my head when I, when I read it, that I fly on it. That, that's it really. Mm. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a lot of, um, it has to do a lot of, uh, with the people and not necessarily with the idea only. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit building also next to all of this a network of people that I think are capable of running startups. In the end, if it's their own or some other business that I suggest to them later, if they fail, that is also fine. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm building quite a nice network of, of people right now, I think, that, that has a lot of different capabilities. And um, if, they, if they work with their own idea or not, uh, that's, that's to be seen later. That's, that's time though. So I think that's interesting. One of the criteria for selection of who he will invest his time in to coach these propositions for new business startups that uh, Fabian's getting, he's putting into that mix the person. If he feels a good affin affinity with them, if he believes in their values and, and shares their convictions, I think that's a very, very fundamental thing which we tend to be a long way from away in the cloud typically. So you're personalizing it and closing that gap. I think that's very yes. insightful for us. Very okay. Good. 
we have a little bit of time for taking some questions from the floor. And we have a special mobile microphone which is going to materialize towards the back of my head any moment. Who would like to kick this session off with the first question to Fabian? Or should I just choose somebody? Ah, thank you. I couldn't see you. Could I have the microphone, please? Thank you. Okay. Don't move. Does everyone else have good insurance cover nearby? Okay. Oh! <laughs> Not just a pretty face. Okay, question. Wait on, wait on. I don't think we've got sound yet. I may have done such a good throw, I've broken the microphone. Let's just check. Okay, you're good. No. I've chosen the only man in the room who's a ventriloquist. Could you? We'll give it one more try and then I'll ask you to shout. All right. Shout. And Good. Could you just recover that question for me? I couldn't quite hear it. <laughs> Come up to the stage and we'll get this sorted immediately. And we'll have special surgery done on the microphone. In the meantime, come and join me up here. I'd like you to meet Fabian and Matt, Marcus. Yep. Marcus, welcome. The only man with enough courage to come up and talk about his interests in this business. <laughs> <laughs> Brave man. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Co question uh, to Fabian. Given the huge amount of hits on your on your sites, how um, um, strong was the, the the race in the criminal attempts and the attacks on those sites, and how um, um, how hard was it to defend that? Uh, this was one of the reasons why we used, uh, as I said, manage slash co location hosting. Uh, the the host we used was actually very very good at at security. Um, and it was the main reasons why, why we chose them. Uh, and they solved all these problems. So I never had to deal with them. That was very lucky for me. Uh, and they were very good at it. And it happened constantly, of course, as, as, you, as, you, as you said, uh, of course, especially in this business, uh, it's always interesting for people to try to do some silly stuff. Um, so yes, it happened a lot. Uh, I can sadly not tell you numbers because, as I said, they they uh, they used uh, they handled this, not me. Okay, thank you. Great argument for the value proposition of your service provider in the terms yes. of the managed component to the service. Excellent, Marcus. Thank you. Do you have a second question? Because it would be a lot simpler for you to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> what is question number two, Marcus? Um, no. <laughs> I have a question for you. Who cut your hair? What? Uh, myself. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Marcus. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question, and I'm not going to throw it this time. Ah, over here. Um, do you have a lot of legal issues with the content uh, on the websites um, in case of illegal videos and material um, against laws? Could you repeat the question? Do so, you have a lot of legal issues? Legal issues, thank you. And the answer is so, no. <laughs> so, so when, the, when I, when I uh, took over the tube sites, which obviously is the, the bigger source of all these problems, um, I, the first thing I did is I hired a company, uh, a, a law firm in, in LA, uh, the, actually the same one that sued Napster in the end, or was one of the ones that was together in the lawsuit against Napster and told them, I want you to explain every single point of, uh, of attack uh, that these websites uh, have and um, so that we can go against them right away and solve them so that they don't happen. Um, so we had 
quite a good uh, discussion with them and they explained everything. And uh, I think they are still uh, legal representatives of, of MindGeek today. I'm quite sure at least they are. Uh, and it's, uh, so from the side of copyright problems, there was uh, no issue because we followed all the MCA laws and, and regulations in the US and that is basically the, a good base of, of, of worldwide how it works. Um, in terms of illegal content, uh, what we did do is we uh, used one of the provisions of the MCA that allows uh, us to review content in terms of legalities. So we had a team of roughly 30 or so people that all day long would review content, uh, either that is flagged <laughs> by users. Now, I want you to understand, they did that job at no salary. <laughs> That's, uh, That's dedication. But, you, know, you know, it's... Uh, it's a lot more work than you think. Yeah? <laughs> this, uh, eight hours at a time is quite stressful. Stressful. <laughs> okay, that sort of stress quite a lot of people like. <laughs> so yes, so we had it reviewed and uh, we did flag quite a bit of content um, that got uploaded uh, that we didn't want there. And we were very strict in terms of all the, the rules that are there. A lot more strict than a lot of other sites are today. Um, uh, and, and this kind of saved us. So we never had a real we never had a real legal issue there. And uh, MindGeek today is still being sued now and then by uh, competitors in terms of uh, copyright um, issues. But until today, they have not found any point of attack that actually works. And I don't see one. Uh, based on DMCA and, and such, I just don't see one. And it makes sense to me. So uh, no problem there. Thank you. Please help me thank Fabian Tillman, from the founder of MindGeek, for joining us today from his sickbed at home, the pioneer of the whole industry that we know so well today. Behind the scenes, a story of technology, the world's largest network of adult sites. Fabian, thank you. Thank you.